The ERMAC Center is proud to present the SFU Canada Research Chairs Seminar Series. This bi-weekly series hosts six presentations per semester. For the fall 2008 and spring 2009 semesters, the presenters belong to the Faculty of Science and the current Faculty of Applied Science. Today's speaker is Dr. Gwen Flowers. Dr. Flowers will present her talk entitled Glacier and Ice Sheet Dynamics in a Warming World. Today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, one of uh, the world's very talented uh, glaciologists, Dr. Gwen Flowers. Gwen uh, is a Canada Research Chair. She came to the Department of Earth Sciences here at SFU back in 2005. She did her PhD at University of British Columbia in the field of geophysics. She then went on to do a postdoc for about two years at the University of Iceland. And then she went back to UBC and did a second postdoc for about two years before coming here. Gwen is credited with uh, 16 peer-reviewed publications, 10 of which she is lead author on, and one of which at this very stage, early stage of her career she is uh, sole author on. So um, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Gwen Flowers. Thanks, Gwen. Thank you. Well, I'd like to start by thanking Veselin for the in, uh, invitation to speak in this series. It's a real honor to be part of this. And I'd like to thank all of you for taking time to come out today. What I'd like to do in this talk is really give you a brief overview of what we know about the current state of our terrestrial cryosphere. And that means the ground-based or land-based ice we have around the globe today. And I'd like to emphasize why it's important that we understand glacier and ice sheet dynamics in order to interpret the changes we're seeing today and to better anticipate the changes we might see in the future. I'll give a few examples from my past research and from the research we've started here at SFU in the last three years that we think is really aimed to address some of the key uncertainties in being able to project what types of changes we'll see um, in our glaciers and ice sheets in the future. The picture you see in the background here is Casco Walsh Mountain. This is a view from one of our field sites in the Yukon. Uh, it was taken this year in May and I hope to say a few words about that project at the end of our talk. But what I'd like to do is start with a little video that gives you a, a visual sense of something that's been really of interest to the glaciological community <coughs> in the last couple of years. And that's this um, acceleration and rapid retreat of many of the Greenland outlet glaciers. This uh, rapid retreat in mass loss has been uh, accompanied by iceberg calving or the production of icebergs at the termini of these glaciers. And this video shows you what a typical calving event looks like. This was recorded in 2007. And the sound that you'll hear with the video is actually the seismic signature of the event rendered so that we can hear it. So, Keep your eyes trained on this big iceberg that's calving off. This ice front in the background is about 100 meters high. As this iceberg rolls over, it's about 1,000 meters long. So this is quite a different scale of calving than you might see on a cruise ship in Alaska. You see the clean blue ice coming from far down in the glacier. All of this ice that you see moving is actually floating ice. It's been calved off the terminus of the glacier and it's moving out of the fjord toward open water here. So you can see all this is, is ice in the fjord. In the background is the glacier itself, which is flowing out of the screen effectively toward the calving front. Okay, so the picture you just saw came from somewhere around here. This particular outlet glacier is called Ilulisat Glacier, or Jakob Salvanispre. It's one of the fastest flowing outlet glaciers in the world. It's situated here on the western margin of the Greenland Ice Sheet, and it alone drains about 7% of the entire Greenland Ice Sheet. So what happens to this glacier is really important for what happens to the ice sheet. What's been exciting to us is that we've seen um, a rapid acceleration and retreat in the last couple of years, starting in the late 1990s. If you look at this image on the left, this is the margin of the Greenland ice sheet. Ice is flowing from right to left into this narrow fjord. At the time this image was taken in 2001, the ice front is sitting right here. So all of this white stuff you see in front is, is floating ice that's been calved off the terminus that's filling the fjord. And this fjord is one of the cradles of those icebergs that we like to see off the coast of Newfoundland. In the late 1990s, an accelerated retreat occurred. So these black lines are marking the terminus position of the glacier from 1851 
through 2006, and this retreat accelerated in recent years, which is interesting in and of itself to us, but what's more interesting is that a simultaneous acceleration and retreat also occurred on a couple of the other really large outlet glaciers in Greenland, um, namely Kangard Lusuak and Helheim glaciers on the east coast. So we're seeing a simultaneous and rapid retreat and acceleration of these large outlet glaciers. Well, we've been talking about the Greenland ice sheet up here. Greenland is, of course, one of our two modern day ice sheets. And by ice sheet, I mean an ice mass of continental scale. Our other ice, our other ice mass is Antarctica here. And if you want to have a sense of how much ice or fresh water is stored in these different reservoirs, Antarctica holds about 10 times as much ice as Greenland, which in turn holds more than 10 times as much ice as is stored in all of the other little glaciers and <coughs> ice caps around the world. So all of these little blue bits that you see in this map here are the glaciers and ice caps of the world. And you can see that in our part of the world, we're sitting in, in one of the most heavily glacierized regions. A more intuitive way to think about these volumes is in terms of sea level equivalent. So that is, if you took this ice mass, one of these ice masses, off the land and put it in the ocean, this is how much sea level would rise. So Antarctica stores about 65 to 70 meters of sea level equivalent. Greenland's about 10 times less with 6 to 7 meters. And all of the rest of the glaciers and ice caps store less than 1 meter. OK, well, I'd like to give you a sense about what we know about the mass balance, the current state of mass gain or loss of these various ice masses. This image here that I'll explain in a minute summarizes what we know about the Greenland ice sheet. <coughs> and what it tells us is that Greenland <coughs> is losing mass and appears to be doing so at an accelerating rate. This is a study that compiled um, all of the individual studies that attempted to estimate the continental mass balance of the Greenland ice sheet. And what you see here is mass balance plotted. So anything above the dotted zero line indicates a mass gain. Anything below is a mass loss. And this is plotted as a function of time from 1960 to about 2006. The, each box represents one study. And the length of the box represents the time period to which the study applies. The height of the box represents the estimated uncertainty on the study. And so what we see from this collection of boxes below the zero line um, is a strong indication of mass loss from Greenland. What's interesting about this mass loss is that a lot of it has occurred by what we call dynamic thinning. So if you imagine a stagnant ice sheet and you add some ice and you take away some ice, we could have a mass change that's just a simple function of what the climate's doing. But because ice moves, we have um, ice carried from the interior of the ice sheet out into these fjords, calved into the ocean, and transported away from the continent that way. So a lot of the ice loss that we're seeing seems to be a function of the acceleration of these outlet glaciers that cause thinning and they cause drawdown of the interior ice and export ice from the continent. Can I ask a quick question? What makes a glacier an outlet glacier? <clears throat> we usually call an outlet glacier something that's connected to a much larger ice mass, so a, an ice sheet or an ice field or an ice cap. And it's just a, a narrow funneling of ice that discharges ice. Thanks. So this is a, a Lulisat glacier, or Jakob Savinisbre again. What you see in color is a satellite-derived velocity field for 1992 and for 2000. So the ice, again, is flowing from right to left in these pictures. The blue-green colors here tell us that the ice is going somewhere between 5 and 7 kilometers per year in, in 1992 and something in excess of 11 kilometers per year in 2000. So this is an acceleration of that outlet glacier attended by a retreat if you look at the ice front positions in those two pictures. So this, this begs the obvious question, what's causing this dynamic acceleration? If the dynamics are controlling the mass balance of the ice sheet, we want to understand why they work. And I'd be happy to talk about um, what we're finding out over lunch, if anyone's interested in Greenland especially. If we look at the same estimate of mass balance for Antarctica, we have far fewer data. It's a bit of a fuzzier picture. Again, each of these boxes represents an individual study. So this is mass balance of the entire continent of Antarctica as a function of time from 1960 to about 2006. And what we see is that we, while we have a dearth of data, there are quite a few studies that are suggesting a net mass loss for Antarctica. 
This to us comes as a surprise. We expected in a generally warming world we'd see higher rates of precipitation and accumulation in cold areas and we expected that Antarctica would experience an increase in mass with warming. So this is something that we don't quite understand and clearly we need more data to, to really figure out um, whether the continent is gaining or losing mass. One of the exciting techniques that's come online to be able to estimate the mass balance of these large ice masses is the gravity recovery and climate experiment, or GRACE. The reason we're excited about this is because this method is uh, entirely different from many of the other methods we use to estimate mass balance. So we use uh, laser altimetry from aircraft, satellite radar altimetry, uh, combined with ground-based measurements and modeling. But this technique is one that effectively weighs the ice sheets directly. There are two satellites, gray satellites, orbiting, um, following one another around the globe, and they measure time variable gravity. As they travel over a gravity anomaly, they experience differential acceleration over that anomaly, and the displacement between the satellites that's measured can be used to infer the gravitational field below. So if we want to understand how the mass of the ice sheets is changing over time, we can correct this signal for um, a couple of other large sources of mass redistribution around the globe, namely the seasonal hydrologic cycle that has variable amounts of water stored on land versus in the ocean, and post-glacial rebound. Post-glacial rebound turns out to be the largest signal that GRACE measures. So that's the movement of mantle material um, in the isostatic process. The first results came out a couple of years ago for Antarctica and they're giving us a really interesting picture about what's happening in the different sectors of Antarctica. This shows ice mass here as a function of time from 2002 to 2005. So this is a relatively new technique. Over this period, what we see after you do the corrections is that the West Antarctic ice sheet is losing mass. This is the red line trending down and we don't have any clear signal from the East Antarctic ice sheet. We can't detect uh, either a positive or negative trend in the mass balance of the East Antarctic ice sheet shown in green. This part of Antarctica is the East Antarctic ice sheet. This part is the West that we were just talking about. And this figure is to emphasize that we need to understand dynamics fundamentally to evaluate mass balance in Antarctica. What you see here is the balance velocity. Now this is a calculated quantity based on the mass balance and the geometry of the ice sheet that gives us a picture of the overall flow structure of the ice sheet. What you see in dark and black are very slow ice flow velocities, reds are intermediate velocities, and then these bright colors, purple, white, and yellow, are the highest ice velocities. What this picture tells us is that Antarctica is drained by these fast flow features, uh, many of which we call ice streams because the flow of ice in these corridors is so fast compared to the surroundings. And the tributaries of these ice streams stretch quite far into the interior of the ice sheet. Antarctica is very cold, so over most of the ice sheet we don't have any melt. We have melt on the peninsula and some places around uh, the perimeter at sea level. But most of the ice loss from Antarctica occurs by calving, again, production of icebergs, discharge of icebergs into the ocean. And these icebergs are discharged. They come down from the interior through these ice streams. Those ice streams feed these ice shelves or calve directly into the ocean. So mass loss from Antarctica occurs primarily by calving, and that's a function of the flow field of the ice sheet. Okay, well, what's the problem with ice sheets? Um, sea level is the most obvious problem, so I've focused on that. These ice sheets store an enormous amount of fresh water, and we would like to know how much of that might end up in the ocean um, over time. This graph here is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change fourth assessment report that came out in 2007. It's a projection of sea level here from up to 0 0.8 meters as a function of time from 1990 to 2100. The gray in the background here and the red lines are the projections from the 2001 report. And the 2007 projections are shown as these blue bars. The difference between these blue bars is that in the light blue bar, um, there's been some accounting of ice dynamics. So our problem is we don't understand continental ice dynamics well enough to be able to incorporate them in general circulation models and predict how dynamics might change and therefore how the discharge of ice to the ocean might change from the ice sheets and raise sea level. And this 
is actually the leading uncertainty in our ability to project sea level over the next 100 years. The panel report concludes that larger values of sea level rise can't be excluded, but understanding of these effects, and by these effects that means acceleration of ice due to dynamic changes, is too limited to assess their likelihood hood, or provide a best estimate or upper bound for sea level rise. So the point is we really don't know where this stops. Okay, well we've talked about the ice sheets. I mean, they're big, they're holding a lot of water. I think the, the concern is fairly obvious that we want to know how fast those are going to melt. But the small glaciers and ice caps also play an important role. This is a table from the same report. It shows sea level rise in millimeters per year from 1961 to 2003. And on the left, it shows the sources of sea level rise. So from what we can estimate in this recent period, thermal expansion or the volumetric expansion of ocean water as it warms accounts for about half of what we're able to estimate from, for sea level rise. And the glaciers and ice caps, all the small bits of ice outside the ice sheets accounts almost for the other half. So these numbers are, are outdated even now, but you can see that Greenland and Antarctica are contributing right now much less than these smaller ice masses. So we've got to pay attention to the smaller ice masses if we want to know what's going to happen over the next decades to 100 years. A paper that came out in 2007 summarizes this problem well. The authors say, although the large ice masses may surpass the glacier contribution in the distant future, glaciers and ice caps, the small ones, their contribution is important now and will remain important for the next century. So we actually need to pay attention to what's happening, not only to the ice sheets, but to the smaller ice masses. Well, let's take a look at how they're doing. You probably know from watching the news that they're not doing very well. This paper summarizes the mass balance of glacierized mountain regions of the world um, in two ways that I'll explain. Each of the colored lines represents a different glacierized mountain region. So in our part of the world, you might want to be looking at this green curve, northwest US to southwest Canada, and the yellowish green curve, Alaska and the Coast Mountains. The metric of mass balance on the left represents a mass gain or loss intensity. So this is an indication of the health of the glaciers in the, these mountain ranges. Here's the zero line, anything below zero represents mass loss. And this is from 1962, about 2003. So all of the major glacierized mountain regions of the world are losing mass. Some are doing so at an accelerating rate. From this plot, you could say that Patagonia is the worst off. The same data are plotted on the right, but in terms of sea level equivalent. So how much water these mountain ranges are contributing to the ocean. And so the plot on the right takes account of the size of the ice, how much ice there is. So Patagonia is suffering here, but it's not contributing the most to sea level rise because there's not as much ice. But if we look at where we are in the world, our glaciers and ice caps are not doing so well. And in fact, the ones along the coast up into Alaska are currently making the largest glaciological contribution to sea level. So the glaciers we have here in our part of the world up to Alaska are very important contributors to current sea level rise. Okay, well just a few glacier basics before we move on. Glaciers exist anywhere where over the long term you have an accumulation of snow that exceeds the ablation or the loss of snow. And we typically have accumulation at high elevations, snow piles on top of snow, slowly compresses the snow into ice. And then that ice flows like a conveyor belt down to lower elevations where ablation takes place. Ablation just means mass loss, so that can be by melting, it can be by sublimation in cold places, it can be by calving into fresh or tide water. Ice is also a very good insulator, so if you put an ice sheet like Greenland or Antarctica that could be um, in excess of three to four kilometers thick on the land and consider the geothermal flux that's in the Earth's crust, while it's very cold up here at the summit, you can have temperatures that are at the melting point at the base of the ice sheet. So although Antarctica and Greenland are very cold, much of the bed of these ice sheets is at the pressure melting point and much of the bed has liquid water present. And that becomes important when we're thinking about dynamics. Okay, well there are two major ways by which glaciers flow. The first is internal deformation and this would be similar to uh, pouring honey over a table and watching it spread under its own weight. So this deformation is, takes place in the ice itself. It's a process that depends strongly on temperature. And what I've shown here is the deformation rate, the strain rate of the ice. This is a measure of how fast ice deforms as a function of stress. 
and you can see that temperature T is in the exponential. So as you warm ice up toward the melting point, deformation takes place much more rapidly. The second mechanism for ice flow is basal sliding or sediment deformation under the ice. So this is a decoupling of the ice in its bed. And this requires an unfrozen bed. So this requires that the ice be at the pressure melting point at the bed and that there be some water present. And a sliding law, we call, that we usually use to describe this process is a function of the basal shear stress, so how much shear is exerted on the bed by the ice. It's also a function of the effective pressure to some positive power. And effective pressure is just the ice overburn pressure minus the water pressure. So if we have higher water pressures under the ice, those facilitate sliding or deformation of sediments underneath. So we need to understand hydrology under the glaciers and ice sheets if we're going to understand this process of glacier motion. So let me just go through, through a few examples of why basal hydrology and dynamics are important in our, the different settings we're talking about. This is a map of Antarctica again. In the background, the red and blue colors are the balance velocities you saw before. So blue means slow flow, these red stream-like features are fast-flowing corridors of ice. On top of that, the blue triangles represent places we know that subglacial lakes exist under Antarctica. And the green stars and green triangles are places where we have evidence that there's subglacial water that's moving around, that's active. And you'll notice the correspondence between um, the slow flow areas and these lakes and the active hydrology indicated by the green stars and triangles and where there's fast flow. We've known since the 1980s that these very fast flowing ice streams down in the Sipal Coast are underlain by saturated marine sediments. Boreholes have been drilled to the bottoms of these ice streams and found uh, pockets of liquid water. So we know that these streams flow fast because they're well lubricated underneath. And recently we're finding that um, this basal hydraulic system in Antarctica is much more dynamic than we thought it was before. Well, in Greenland, the situation's slightly different because we do have a lot of surface melting. And one of the things we're finding in Greenland is that there are quite large areas around the margin of the ice sheet where we're seeing in the, in the spring and summer an accumulation of superglacial water on the ice. So this is an example of one of these meltwater ponds on top of the ice sheet. This one's about a kilometer wide and maybe 10 meters deep. And what we've observed is that many of these lakes drain catastrophically. So sometimes fractures open up underneath the lakes and they drain in a period of a couple of hours. Sometimes water makes its way out of the lakes and uh, goes down through one of these vertical shafts that we call a moulin. So these, there's a lot of sort of meltwater stored on the surface of the Greenland ice sheet and this meltwater is draining into the glacier. In 2002, there was a study done that suggested uh, for the first time that this water may be making its way through, say, 3,000 meters of cold ice getting to the bed, causing the, bed to the ice to decouple from the bed and slide. So if you look at the, the surface velocity of the ice, if you look at those, those red curves, the spikes in the red curves, that represents three different years, compared to the melt energy, looking at the black curves, that's a representation of the cumulative melt energy, there's a correspondence between how much melt there is and how fast the ice flowed. Um, this is just a correspondence and a lot of research has gone into trying to understand whether this could be a causative mechanism, whether water getting to the bed of the ice sheet is really causing the ice to accelerate. This is a process that we've known about for a long time um, under smaller alpine glaciers. So what's surprising about the previous, uh, the data in the previous slide is that that applies to an ice sheet that's very thick and cold ice. And it was prior to that, very hard for a lot of us to imagine that water was actually getting all the way to the bed. But this is something that we've known about for decades on alpine glaciers, that when you have a lot of water stored at the bed, you tend to have high flow velocities. This data set is just one example. What you see here in red is the ice surface speed measured over four days on an Alaskan glacier. And in gray, the calculated change in subglacial water storage. So when this black and gray curve is positive, it means water is accumulating at the bed. When it's negative, it means water is being removed from the bed. So you see an accumulation of water corresponds to an acceleration of the glacier itself. Okay, well, if we wanna understand um, how water flows at the bed, we need to figure out something about the drainage regime of glaciers and ice sheets. 
These, in these little cartoons, are um, a number of different morphologies that have been su suggested to describe subglacial drainage. Each one of these has at least one very detailed theoretical paper behind it, and a couple of them have a lot of studies, um, empirical studies, that have invoked these different types of drainage systems to explain observations. So we could have um, what are called R channels. These are pipes in the ice. We might have channels carved into bedrock. We might have channels that have different aspects. They could be um, carved into soft sediment in the bed. We might have a system of um, cavities that are connected by little conduits. Uh, we could have an aquifer underneath the glacier. We could have a film of water. So there are all these different possibilities. The difference between the top and the bottom rows is that the top, the morphologies on the top comprise what we call fast systems. So they're efficient. They drain water effectively away from the bed. So you, as you add more water, more discharge Q to these systems, the basal water pressure tends to go down and our sliding velocity, if you remember, would probably tend to go down. On the bottom, we have slow systems, so if you, as you add more water to these systems, the basal water pressure increases, and we might expect to have higher sliding velocities. So greater decoupling of the ice and bed with better lubrication due to inefficient basal water flow. Okay, well, if we want to conceptualize what the glacier drainage system might look like, we have to simplify it. And I'm gonna take you through an example of how um, I've done this with my colleagues in past research. We wanna get a conceptual model of glacier drainage that we can translate into a theoretical model, that we can translate into a numerical model and use to understand some of the data that we've recorded. So this is one conceptual model of glacier hydrology. It comprises four different systems. And we've done this to try and simplify, uh, rather than model the entire system as one three-dimensional mess, we've tried to conceptualize this as four two-dimensional systems that are stacked on top of each other. So at the top, we have superglacial drainage. This is water flowing over the surface of the ice, maybe through snow, finding its way into crevasses, maybe pooling on the surface. The end glacial drainage system would be the drainage system that operates, number two, inside the glacier. So you could have water moving through a system of fractures. You could have water uh, filling up crevasses at the surface or at the base. You could have water draining through these vertical shafts that we call moulins. Once the water gets to the bed, we've got it moving around in a subglacial drainage system that could take on any of the morphologies I showed in the cartoons before, or a combination of those morphologies. And then to be general, we might also have some uh, permeable substrate so that we could have a, a subsurface drainage system underneath. Well, for each of these systems, we'd like to define some key variables. So we'd like to define the fluid volume in each system, how much water is stored, a system conductivity, which tells us how fast water might move around, a fluid potential that gives us an indication of the direction of water flow, and then a fluid flux that tells us how much water is moving from place to place. So what I'm going to do is just take you through um, a description of how we might define these for one of the systems. For the subglacial drainage system, we're going to define the fluid volume as some aerially averaged water volume, but it's going to depend on the effective porosity of the drainage system. The system conductivity for the subglacial drainage system is not just a number that you would pull out of a book because we can appreciate the drainage system is fairly complicated. So we use this quantity to describe how connected the drainage system is. So if you've isolated little pockets of water, then they're not gonna be communicating very well. If they're big enough, if they connect, if the system is more connected, you'll have a more conductive, hydraulically conductive system. So we've constructed this function where the conductivity or connectivity of the system is a function of the water content. So as you add more and more water, the system becomes more and more connected. And this type of function emulates the transition from an inefficient slow system to a more efficient fast system. The fluid potential we define in a standard way. So this is the fluid potential is the sum of a pressure potential and an elevation potential. This tells us that water flows will flow down pressure gradients and water will flow downhill. And in this case, we've designed our pressure function to be a statistical function of the microtopography of the glacier bed. And finally, to define our fluid flux, we've borrowed from groundwater hydrology, and we define our flux as essentially a nonlinear Darcy flux. So we've got a conductivity that's a function of how much water is in the system, 
the, the fluid volume in the system itself and the gradient and fluid potential. So we would go through this for each of the systems and then if we want to take this and construct a model from it, we do the following. All I want you to see here is that we have one equation for each system, superglacial, inglacial, subglacial, subsurface, and they all look similar. Each of these equations has uh, di h, di t on the left hand side, and that tells us how much the water volume changes as a function of time in the system. Each equation also has a <coughs> divergence of the flux, and that describes how the fluid flows in the system. And then on the right hand side are all the sources and sinks. So we've got one equation for each layer, but of course water is moving through these different systems, the systems are interacting, and so our source terms on the right hand side are coupled. And so you'll see common source terms in some of the adjacent equations. So this is our way of describing each system in two dimensions, but trying to simulate a three-dimensional system. Okay, well I just picked one example of the results of this model. Um, this model was designed for an alpine glacier in the Yukon, and this glacier uh, had a lot of sensors in it. We had an extensive borehole drilling program where we drill through the ice and install sensors at the glacier bed that had wires coming up and data were recorded on data loggers year round. So what you see here is a collection of these borehole water pressure records from the bottom of the glacier. So we have water pressure as measured um, over a period of two weeks. So gray is what we observe, blue is what we simulate with this model. And uh, given the complexity of this system and that we're used to getting things wrong and our errors are huge, we think this is really good. So I don't know how it looks to you, but for us, this is spectacular. Okay, so, so the point here is that with this model, with a simple model, we're able to simulate our observations reasonably well. But what we've been talking about is just hydrology. What if we want to simulate ice dynamics? What if we want to simulate the effect that hydrology has on dynamics? Then we need to come up with a model that describes the way ice flows, the way ice moves. And I'm not going to go through that, but suffice it to say that we derive our governing equations from conservation principles. So we conserve mass, momentum, and energy. We use Glenn's flow law, the empirical relation that describes the relation between applied stress and deformation rate. And that is our system of equations that we solve. So if we use conservation of momentum, Glenn's flow law, and some simplifying assumptions, we can come up with an analytical expression for glacier velocity as a function of depth. So U is velocity, and in this formulation, the surface velocity, what you might measure at the surface, is simply the sum of the deformational velocity, so how much the ice is deforming underneath, and the basal sliding speed that we saw before. And the rate of ice deformation depends on these parameters. So it depends on the rheology or the properties of ice, how soft it is, its effective viscosity. It depends on density, acceleration, and then it depends on the geometry of the ice. So it depends on the surface slope and it depends on the ice thickness. Okay, well here's an example from our work in Iceland. Um, we spent a lot of time modeling this ice cap called Vatniokel along the southeast coast of Iceland. This is a NASA image of Vatniokel. It's about 150 kilometers across, so it's quite a large ice cap. It's also really interesting because it's got all these uh, geothermal areas underneath, subglacial eruptions, outburst floods, uh, surging in fast flowing glaciers, so it's a, it's a playground for glaciologists. So we've tried um, simulating this ice cap with these simple ice flow models. And an example is shown on the right. This profile goes right through here. So we have this end of the profiles over here. We have elevation of the glacier surface and of the glacier bed. The observations, the measurements are in solid lines and the simulations are in dashed lines. The simulations here are using a sliding law that doesn't include hydrology. So if you didn't include sliding at all, uh, the profiles would be really wrong. So we need to include this sliding process in order to be able to simulate the geometry and dynamics of this ice cap. So if we take out hydrology and, and just invoke a simple sliding law, then mm, we do an okay job, it's not great. The mismatch between simulations and observations is here, so we're off by up to 180 meters. If we then use a sliding law that does include hydrology, so one that takes sort of ingests the model of hydrology that I just described and couples that with ice dynamics, then we do a little bit better. So what you should see here is that the, 
the fine line where we use hydrology to come up with our sliding law is actually underneath the observations here. We've still got problems over here and these arise from a number of factors, uh, one being that these are steady state observations and we rarely find our ice caps in steady state. But you can see that the basic idea here is we take our uh, mismatch from this top line down to something much more reasonable. So we're able to make an improvement in our simulation of the ice cap by expressing sliding in terms of basal hydrology. Okay, well the question is naturally what's going to happen to glacier night sheet dynamics in the future. This just happens to be a simulation from the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder Community Climate System Model. This is for Iceland with a 1% per year CO2 increase and if you can read the numbers here you could see that this predicts about a 2 degree increase in temperature over Iceland until 2100. And so we've taken this estimate and just used it as a sensitivity that we'd like to explore. So what's going to happen to Vatniokul if we do actually see this two degree warming by 2100? Well, let me review first what we might expect. So how does atmospheric warming affect glaciers? Well, we might expect more melting. We might expect more accumulation as we have moister air. So we could have a change in mass balance. And a change in mass balance like this might take the glacier tens to hundreds of years to respond to. I also said that the deformation of ice was a strong function of ice temperature. So if it gets warmer, we might expect that to affect deformation. So we might expect something like that, but for the heat up here to get down here where all the deformation's happening takes a really long time. So the time scale for conduction and advection of that heat to where the ice is deforming uh, might be really long. It depends on the size of the ice mass and the flow speeds, but it could be ten to th tens to thousands of years. Another possible mechanism would be through hydrology. So if we've got meltwater on the surface that's getting to the bed, decoupling the bed, causing sliding, we might expect more water to produce more sliding. And this is a bit of an oversimplification, but it's one possibility. The interesting thing about this mechanism is that the time scale is really rapid. It, it could be less than one year. Okay, so this is our simulated Vatniokul ice cap. I've done a little scrapbooking exercise where I've put our simulated ice cap on top of a real image of Iceland. And I'm just going to show you a couple of snapshots using this two degree C per century warming. So we simulate that uh, this is our present day ice cap. After 100 years, it might look something like this, 150. And then after 200 years, it's very scrawny indeed. Well, let's look at if let's examine if we see this sort of um, meltwater lubrication effect working. This is the ice cap here. Each of these profiles uh, follows a flow line of one of the outlet glaciers. And what you see on the right, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G didn't fit, but these correspond to these different flow lines. I'd like you to look at the the thick dashed line. This is the present day predicted flow speed on a given outlet glacier and compare basal flow speed, excuse me, compared to say the solid black line, the flow speed predicted 100 years into the future. So in places where you see the solid black line higher than the, the dashed black line, those are places where, where we predict sliding will increase with warming. Okay, so for this ice cap, we do predict that sliding does increase with warming. But let's see what happens at the ice surface, what happens to the total velocity. So we do have a basal flow enhancement with warming, but if we look at the total surface velocity, that's the sum of deformation and sliding. So again, look at the fat dashed line, present day, compared to the solid line, 100 years into the future. The solid line isn't really above the dashed line substantially anywhere. So we see that overall, the surface velocities are going down. So what we're seeing here is that the increase in sliding is outstripped by the reduction in deformation because deformation depends on slope. So as slopes reduce and as ice thins, the deformation rates go down. So for Iceland, we don't really see a strong acceleration in response to warming by this hydrological effect. But, but Vatniokul is a temperate glacier. So this is a glacier with a vigorous hydrologic cycle. Meltwater gets to the bed almost everywhere. We might expect that the effect of hydrology is really saturated in this type of situation. And there's significant differences between a temperate ice cap, one that it's entirely at the melting point, compared to a cold ice sheet where introduction of water to the bed of a cold ice sheet might warm the base and it might decouple the base for the first time. 
Okay, so one of the areas in which we're actively working is in trying to model the dynamics of polythermal glaciers. And that means glaciers that aren't entirely at the melting point. So they might be cold in the body of the glacier and at the melting point at the base, kind of like many places in Greenland. We're, as part of an international polar year project, uh, we're involved in modeling this Belcher Glacier. This is the Devon Island ice cap in the Canadian Arctic. The Belcher Glacier is a large outlet of this ice cap, and in many ways it resembles the outlet glaciers we have in Greenland. So this is a picture of the Belcher Glacier. We've got these surface meltwater ponds that occur on the surface in spring and summer. Some of these drain to the bed. This is also a tidewater glacier, so it's got calving going on at the front. And so what we're trying to do is understand how hydrology and how changes in the stresses of this outlet glacier will affect its future dynamics. So we're looking at a conceptual model, something like this. Here's our uh, cross section of our outlet glacier. Icebergs are breaking off at tidewater. We're ha we have accumulation of surface water in these lakes. This is another photo from the Belcher Glacier itself. These lakes may drain to the bed, as we've seen in Greenland, and cause uplift of the ice itself as the water pools at the bed, and that water then may drain subglacially. Um, in Greenland, uplift and horizontal acceleration has been measured in direct response to the drainage of these lakes. We're just not sure how big a collective effect these lake drainages can have. They do have local effects, but we're not sure how they affect the whole outlet glacier. And then we might have water flow over the surface um, going into fractures, pushing these fractures to the bed and allowing the water to get down that way. These are all processes that have been um, observed in Greenland, so we're basing our conceptual model on research that's been done elsewhere. And there's a theory that was developed um, sometime before 2007 that suggests that it is possible with certain discharge rates to get these fractures propagating all the way through two and 3,000 meters of cold ice. So we're putting this together in numerical models, and um, this is currently being carried out primarily by my postdoc, Sam Pimentel, who's working on developing sophisticated models of glacier dynamics that incorporate hydrology so we can understand uh, the future dynamics of these outlet glaciers. We're right now in the sort of testing and evaluation stage. So that's what I've, I'm showing here. These are Sam's figures. These are um, test case from model intercomparison projects. This is predicted surface velocity of a test glacier as a function of distance, and basal shear stress as a function of distance. The blue spaghetti um, summarizes the results of the other models in this intercomparison, and the red line is the SFU model. So we're very pleased with the way that, that our model's performing, and our next step over the next few months is to add in hydrology and be able to have a more complete picture of what we might expect for the Belcher Glacier and then eventually for some of the Greenland outlet glaciers. So it's great if we can understand the processes that are going to govern the change in dynamics of these glaciers and affect the mass balance of ice sheets. But another of the big questions that we're asking is, how does the response of glaciers vary regionally? And this is important because these small glaciers and ice caps will make an important contribution to sea level over the next couple of decades to centuries. And if we look at a picture like this, it's really messy, it's complicated. We've got small and large glaciers and complicated topography, and yet we need to be able to estimate um, what's gonna happen to these glaciers. So we've started a program in the southwest corner of the Yukon where that little white square is in the St. Elias Mountains. And what we're attempting to do is evaluate the regional variability of glacier response to climate. So this box here gives you an indication of the size of a regional climate model grid cell. These models are the most finely resolved, large-scale, sophisticated climate models that we have. And so if we're to use these models and incorporate glaciers, we need to say what's happening at this scale. Okay, so our approach to this is, has been to select these two study glaciers, examine them in detail, and try and develop relationships that will apply to larger areas. So I'd just like to show you um, first our um, objectives, our methods, and then an example of some of the, the recent results. So we've launched this field-based program. We did it, our first season was 2006, and the aim is to characterize this regional variability of glacier climate relationships. And of course, if, as I've been saying, we'd also like to assess the role of glacier dynamics in modulating mass balance. 
And our methodology is fairly simple. We're first going to monitor the forcing, that's the weather or the climate, measure the response in terms of glacier mass balance, characterize the glacier dynamics, and then model the interaction between these three. Okay, so we've been busy over the last three years in the field making measurements, first monitoring the weather. We've set up a number of weather stations on our study glaciers and throughout the mountain range. Um, this is a picture of, in September, at one of our study sites, my graduate student Brett Wheeler servicing one of our MET stations. We've been measuring mass balance in spring and fall and summer. Um, these are pictures of measuring accumulation and doing snow pit analysis. And then we've been characterizing glacier dynamics a number of ways, uh, primarily by measuring ice surface velocity with global positioning system receivers drilled into the ice and tracking flow speed over time. We've also done a number of geophysical surveys. This is an ice penetrating radar survey that we carried out earlier this year to um, be able to measure the geometry of our study glaciers for model inputs. So these are some of our, just an example of some of our first results. This is the work of Brett Wheeler, master's student, and he's working on modeling the melt of these glaciers. So what you see here is uh, modeled melt as a function of time from July to late August. And you see in the red line here, a sort of standard classical temperature index melt model. And in the red line here, a radiation enhanced melt model. So this is just one of many examples of the modeling that we're doing. And we're really in trying to investigate the key melt processes, what processes have to be included in these models to get the melt right, the transferability of melt models, so we can we um, calibrate a model at one site and then apply it to another site, and the best data sets that we need to drive the model. So it turns out that the, the inputs we use to drive these models are really important to the results. In characterizing glacier dynamics, I show you just one figure from uh, another of my master's students, Letitia de Paoli. This is one of our study glaciers, and from A to A prime, I've drawn a flow line along this glacier. What you see here are Letitia's modeling results from A to A prime. This is velocity, so if you look at the black crosses, these things, those are measured surface flow speeds, how fast the glacier is going as measured at the surface, and Letitia's modeled in the blue line the, the basal sliding speed. So you see that the blue line and the black line are very similar over most of the glacier. This means that almost all of the motion we measure at the surface is a function of the basal sliding speed. And this is a fairly unusual situation. So this is exciting to us because these glacier dynamics really provide a great opportunity to evaluate the influence of dynamics on mass balance. Okay, well if you remember anything from this talk, I'd suggest these three points. First, as a community, uh, we understand right now that Greenland and West Antarctica are losing mass. The signal from the East Antarctic ice sheet is more ambiguous. We can't really tell if it's gaining or losing mass. It appears to be in balance at the moment. Ice dynamics play a significant role in this mass loss, and dynamics of the ice sheets currently represent the greatest uncertainty we have in predicting near-term future sea level. Finally, the mountain glaciers and ice caps, all the little bits of ice outside the ice sheets, are making the largest glaciological contribution to sea level rise. The other component is the thermal expansion of the oceans. And the glaciers in our neighborhood and the coast mountains up toward Alaska are leading the way. Our research conclusions, uh, first of all, our ability to model glacier hydrology and basal processes is really key to understanding ice dynamics, both at the ice sheet scale and for the smaller glaciers and ice caps. Very few models have actually coupled hydrology and dynamics. There are only three large-scale models that have done so, and none of these models uh, really treats ice dynamics in a way that is sophisticated enough to simulate the complex flow that we see at the margins of the Greenland ice sheet and other places in the Canadian Arctic islands. And finally, at SFU, we're working toward addressing these knowledge gaps by developing coupled models for polythermal glaciers and also by assessing regional climate glacier variability and the role that dynamics plays in modulating glacier response to climate. So I'd like to close just by acknowledging the people with whom I've worked at SFU, uh, my graduate students, postdocs, and undergrads, and uh, their contributions, of course, have been integral to the progress we've been able to make over the last three years. And this has been one of the, the great pleasures for me um, in my short time at SFU. So uh, thanks for your attention, and I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you, Ben. Uh, we have time for questions. So, questions? Steve? 
So do you, um, as part of this work, it, uh, do you do any, do you pay any attention to try to um, determine like what relationship any of this has to human activities or is that just, you just sort of put that in externally like somebody projects a upward the, trend in temperature. Okay, the question was do we pay any attention to whether any of these changes are due to human activities and you can separate um, I guess climate studies and, and maybe glacier studies into detection and attribution. So detecting the change and then attributing the change to a cause. And so as glaciologists, we're really using the output of these general circulation models to drive our glacier models. And in a way, um, we're not involved in discerning to what that change is attributed. Now, if you look at the general circulation models, and I know there are people in the audience who know this better than I do, but you could apply a general circulation model that doesn't include any anthropogenic forcing, so all natural forcing, and you can't possibly uh, recover the temperature rise that we've measured over the last century. You could employ a general circulation model that includes anthropogenic forcing combined with natural forcing. And that's typically what we do to project into the future. We choose scenarios that we think are, are most likely, that are recommended by the climate community, and we drive our models with those. And what we try to do is explore a number of different situations. So in the Iceland work I showed, we looked at uh, one to four degrees warming, which spans uh, quite a broad range of possibilities for the next hundred years. And those scenarios did include increases in anthropogenic CO2. So as glaciologists, we're less involved in asking why these changes are happening. We're borrowing from the atmospheric community and applying their model results to drive our models. We do have opinions on why this is happening, but, but we are not the primary experts. Yes, Gwen, this is a very interesting seminar. Um, I have one question about the uh, um, response to the hydrological processes. I assume that this is a very non-linear response of the glaciers to the yeah. increasing availability of water, particularly at the base of glaciers. Do you have any chance or any thoughts of uh, how to model that more realistically, since it's apparently key to this rapid kind of response you're mm -hmm. seeing? Um, we do have ideas about that, and we're working on that right now. But I think. I think the way forward is to be able to describe the basal hydrology, basal hydraulic system um, at a large scale. So if we're thinking about thousands of, uh, an ice sheet over thousands of kilometers, we can't possibly use a finite difference model to model a single tunnel underneath the ice. But what we can do and what we're starting to do is um, apply the physics that we know govern these different basal hydraulic systems, tunnels, canals, porous flow. Um, but doing the, the water mass balance at the broad scale. So we're, we're just now finding ways to apply the physics at the process scale of a tunnel, but account for the mass balance of water at the numerical grid scale. So it's complicated, and I think that that's something that's limited our progress so far, that you just simply can't model where the tunnels, you don't know where the tunnels are. You, they might be there, but you can't specify where they are. So that's another um, trick in the modeling is you have to come up with a framework that allows you to um, honor the physics, properly account for the water balance without having to specify exactly where channels are. So we're doing things like specifying um, channel densities and uh, channel propensities to develop. And that, of course, requires a lot of creative thinking about how to represent these small discrete elements at the large scale. Something I can say from um, a, a detail I sort of skipped over from field-based studies is that we know, I've oversimplified this, but if you add a lot of water to the glacier bed, you can take a slow and efficient drainage system and make a fast one. So there's sort of a window of response that if you add a lot of water um, to the base of the Greenland ice sheet, we are expecting acceleration. But if you add too much, then you undermine that because then you develop an efficient drainage system that serves to evacuate the bed. So it's not even as simple as figuring out when we have slow versus fast drainage, because if you have too much water in one, you shift to the other. And that's, that's a subtlety that I think is um, skipped in a lot of these news media level reports, but something that as glaciologists we're, we're really aware of from our experience on alpine glaciers, where we see these systems transforming back and forth every season. Yeah, your models tend to drive basal velocity. Um, 
I'm wondering whether they are um, sensitive enough to um, uh, pick out uh, faster velocities related to substrate movements versus uh, true sliding, true decoupling, mm -hmm. or whether it matters. I would argue that it doesn't matter, but it of course depends on what you're looking at. I know it matters for what you do. Um, but the way we've treated, I, I say sliding because it's just an easy thing to think about. What we've modeled really is basal flow. So it's the sum of sliding and deformation. And we don't worry about which one occurs the, because our notion of it is that high water pressures favor either one. And whether it's sediment deformation or sliding, that's a different form of movement than we have than ice deformation. So we haven't worried about discriminating about that. But um, there has been past work that we've been involved in where, you know, modeling the, the Laurentide ice sheet, where you're looking at sediment cover of the bed and you might have different rules to govern sliding where there is soft sediment and where there's bedrock. Now, I think from my experience modeling, the difference is um, if you have a thick layer of highly porous sediment, you can accommodate much more water before you reach high water pressures than if you have a thin bed where you're effectively forming a water sheet with any introduction of water. So I think you could separate those two flow mechanisms if you do have differences in substrate character. And it seems to me, although you probably know better, that hard beds would favor um, a more rapid increase in basal water pressure than uh, very permeable, thick sedimentary beds. Any other question? If not, let us thank our speakers again. Thank, thank you. Brian. The focus of the SFU Canada Research Chairs Seminar Series is to provide an opportunity to the wider SFU community to learn more about the current research interests of the SFU Canada Research Chair holders. Our next presentation will be on November 20, 2008. Dr. Gabor Tardos will present his talk entitled Fingerprinting Digital Documents.